Cool. Uh, okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Ty Curtis. This is Emily Craven. Um, thank you all for coming tonight, but also thank you very much for, for inviting us. Um, the, I guess the, the things that I've created and the thing that I've created with Emily is a bit of a, a weird kind of concept. So it is kind of nice to be invited somewhere because I don't really know where we're supposed to go to talk about the project. So it's actually nice to come here and, and talk to you guys about it. Um, so I guess the, the idea of tonight is that I'll, I'm going to run you through uh, my initial project that, that I built uh, and Emily is going to do the exact same. And then we're going to talk about the project that, that we built together because they're both kind of similar similar but different. Um, both, uh, both of the AR uh, storytelling experiences that, that I've built have been built uh, in Unity and use a plugin called uh, Euphoria and that's how we activate the AR component of it. Um, I'll be very, very honest and say that I'm not the developer. Um, I'm the producer, director, writer, particularly for the first project that I'm going to talk about. Um, so as far as the tech questions go, I'm not very good with it. Basically, the process or relationship that I have with my developers was, can I do this? And they say yes or, or no. Um, so that's a, pretty much the depth of, of what I know about Unity and Vuforia. So don't ask me techie questions. But I can talk to you about the story that we've had with developing the, uh, the projects. Um, so I'll talk about me and we'll talk about her. Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I've I kind of started dabbling in augmented reality in 2013, I think. Um, my first experience was using an app called or Orasma, and then I kind of got a little bit obsessed with it and started looking for different ways that I could apply this technology to things. At that time, I was creating um, children scavenger experiences um, where kids would run around a venue looking for digital clues, and the, the clues were just hidden in, in iPads. Um, so after I found augmented reality, I started to work out whether I could use that technology with the stuff that we'd already created. Um, and, and all of a sudden, we kind of created this, this weird format. So the first one is called the Monster Zoo, and that's the case study that I'm going to just, uh, talk to you guys about tonight. We also did uh, an orientation day at a, at a school with something like 150 Year 7 kids, where, again, it was like a digital scavenger hunt um, using augmented reality to put a digital layer over the top of their school um, to ori orientate the Year 7s that were about to start at the school. Uh, the thing in the wall is the project that, um, that Emily and I have created together. So um, that's the, the demo stuff that we've got here. We'll also go, go over a little bit about what it's about as well. Um, and Exhibit is a platform that I've got in development that was shortlisted for the Lord Mayor's Innovation Fund uh, last year. Um, and basically the idea of that is we use augmented reality to fill um, outdoor public spaces with, um, with digital art. So a, a, a public space would look vacant and then you scan it with a device and then um, augmented art would, would, would appear. Um, so those are four projects that we've um, kind of either done or we have in development. So tonight's uh, very much about the Monster Zoo and also the thing in the wall. So I'm going to explain to you, I guess, the process that we've gone through, the game logic that we applied uh, when creating it, and, and then I guess the, the little um, cheeky little adventure that we went on on building it, um, and a little bit about the software and, and hardware and pretty much how we, how we brought it to life. So I've got a video. I don't know whether it's going to, to play or not, though. Ah, uh, potentially. So this just kind of, this is like just a little promo video that we've got to kind of explain the, the idea. Sweet. Our zoo is one like you've never imagined, as it's full of incredible and monsters. The Monster Zoo is a really new exciting experience that we created at Activate Academy. This particular concept of what we've created is an augmented reality experience set in the Perth Museum. And the concept is that there is an invisible zoo that lives in the museum and inhabited by invisible monsters. Who dares wake me? Uh, it's the responsibility of a, a newfound zookeepers to move through the experience and capture one of the main attractions and get him back in his On top of this, uh, we teach the kids documentary filmmaking and the two components that they learn is uh, one is interviews and the other is observational footage. We really like the idea of examining the concept of a scavenger hunt using digital technology and getting kids moving around with technology, um, but then also um, developing skills at the same time. So in this, this case, is documentary filmmaking. 
most of our workshops were completely sold out throughout the festival. Uh, and there's a real buzz going around with, with the type of technology that we're engaging with and the way that the young people are responding to it. You know, we're in the digital age and my kids are familiar with iPads, but I want them to know that it's more than Angry Birds, you know? There's just so many things that these machines are capable of. I just love that, you know, all these possibilities are start by becoming aware of through workshops like this. They just look like they've had such a fantastic time. They're on my guile as well. I love watching that. I love that they each had a turn at filming, finding the monsters, running around the museum. Oh, just wonderful. So you can see who the key audience of my business is. <laughs> Mothers and children. Um, so that's the uh, so the monsters. It was essentially uh, a scavenger hunt that we purpose built for the Perth Museum for a festival called uh, Awesome Arts. Um, I initially pitched the idea of a, a digital scavenger hunt using augmented reality, uh, and the main thing that they really liked about it was not only were the kids engaging with tech in a yeah like young kids engaging with tech in a really unique way, but um, we also taught them documentary storytelling as well. So they were trying to find the monster, but they were also documenting their experience as well. So within an hour and a half. Half. Not only did they go on a digital scavenger hunt, but they also uh, made a little documentary at the end of it as well. So uh, after kind of pitching the idea to the festival and saying this is the wonderful thing that we're going to create, then I kind of went, oh, fuck, how am I going to make this? Um, so I assembled a, a pretty cool team of, of people. There was only a few of us, though, so my role was very much, I guess, the director and, and, and the writer and the producer. Uh, and then I had one person who was the animator, and then I had another person who was the, um, I guess, like the AR realizer, essentially. And then running the actual event, we had, we had two, two facilitators whilst we were over in Perth. Um, so before starting, the idea was, I guess, looking around what was happening with augmented reality to try and figure out how we're going to be able to bring it to life. Um, Unity was obviously by far the most powerful tool that, that we could use. And then we found Vuforia as the, the most appropriate plugin to be able to do the things that, that we wanted to do. And after lots of late nights and, and lots of testing, we were, out, we were able to kind of bring to life the thing that we wanted to, to bring to life. Um, AR back then in 2013, I think is when we started developing, um, that was, was relatively primitive. Um, obviously wearables weren't even a conversation yet. So it's kind of, it's starting to, starting to catch up. Um, and the AR market is starting to progress pretty Pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, but at that time, that was pretty much all the things that we had available to us. Um, as far as writing the, the story, it was relatively it was a relatively um, basic story to, to put together. Um, there's a monster on the loose, or there's an invisible zoo in the in the museum, um, and it's uh, your responsibility to be able to get the monster back in his enclosure. And the course that the participants took was interacting with four different trackpads. Um, and basically the monster went, oh, I've seen him, he's kind of over there. Um, and so then the kids would go from, from A to B. So that's a, a trackpad. Actually, just for a fun little thing, put your hand up if, you, if you, you're aware of augmented reality, have you used it before? Okay, cool, awesome, good. Can I ask another question? Why, why head down a, a monster type scenario and not an actual um, a dinosaur or something that it was, that did exist and, and decided but you decided to head to the monster? So, I mean, everything that I try to do with my, my business has like a bit of a social spin on it. Um, and the monsters in, uh, in the monsters are all, uh, they're all modeled off monster, uh, uh, actual creatures from the endangered species list. So we were having this conversation with kids about endangered species and I guess to kind of pull kids in and, and grab them on, I guess, that fantastical level, um, using monsters is a, is a language that they love and they automatically engage with. That and I kind of like monsters, I guess. It's just a thing that I do. Um, but as far as, uh, oh yeah, which, which kind of brings me to the next point was, was the character design. And I think I've got some images in, in a second. But, um, but uh, the, the process that we went through was a very, very basic script, mainly because we didn't really know what we were doing and we were slightly scared to make it complicated. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the social element of those, those, uh, those creatures were all modeled off the um, uh, animals from the endangered species list. Um, so this is the, um, the 
the process that we went through of trying to find what these creatures were, were going to look like. Um, the animator uh, and designer that we had on board, his name is David Blackwell. I'm not sure whether you guys, you may, you may have come across him before. He's very, very talented. And basically, I just sent him through pictures of um, four different creatures that I wanted to discuss with the kids that were on the endangered species list. Um, so on the far left, if you were looking at it, uh, that's the wombat, wombat monster. Uh, the next one is the Gubaru Gecko Monster, and then the next one is a Leatherback Monster, and then the last one is a Stick Monster. Um, so I basically just found um, animals that I wanted to discuss with the kids, flicked him images of it, and then he came up with all these crazy concept designs. Uh, and those are the four that we, we ended up um, settling on. Um, so as far as designing the, the experience of the... Yep, sorry. Uh, so the, when you design this kind of... Uh characters for child, usually you tend to go with a kind of cute kind of animals and these are not that kind of... You don't reckon they're cute? Cute, but uh, they look nice, but they are not like the big eyes and... and uh, I think they're adorable. <laughs> um, having <laughs> said that... Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's uh, the the stylistic choice that he that he created, or, or that that we run with, was um, I, I I didn't want to go down that that cutesy component. I, I kind of wanted something that still resembled like them as as creatures. To be honest with you, this is actually the scaled back version. The first one that I was presented, the Gubaru monster, which this which is this guy. He was like covered in eyes all over him. I was like, nah, man, that is freaky as hell like <laughs> just just do three eyes so he's got two on his head and one on his tail so yeah I, I see your point but this is actually scale back from what we initially wanted to do um, yeah and and it's also the demographic as well I mean like I work with six to twelve year olds on a regular basis and they kind of want things that are a little bit little bit scary like they don't they don't respond to cute stuff very well the kind of the grosser and slimier it is the, the more they like it which is fine with me um, so as far as building the uh, experience, it's relatively straightforward. So they would arrive uh, at, at the venue. Um, part of that animation that I showed you before was introducing the world to them. So we had to introduce the concept to them. So they watch a, it's like a one minute video about uh, the fact that there's an invisible zoo at this venue. Uh, it's your responsibility to get back in the closure. These are the things that you're looking for. And we showed them the track pads and the technology that they would use to find it. Um, then they would go through and they need to, to um, scan the track pads in the right order. If they didn't, the monsters wouldn't, uh, wouldn't speak to them. But they would, uh, they would scan them, the monster would appear, he would be in idle animation, and then when they touched the device, the monster would spring to life, similar to what the, the leatherback monster did in that example. Um, and then he would give the clue, and then he would go back to sleep. If the participants didn't hear quite clearly what the monster said, then they would touch him again and then he would, would wake up and he would just give like a small snip, snippet of the information to then send them to where, where they needed to go. Um, once they had done all the monsters in the right order, then they returned back to, uh, they returned back to the room and then we edit the film together. Um, so it's a relatively simple process, but what we really needed to think about was what would happen if participant A went and um, scanned trackpad B before uh, scanning trackpad A and what does that what does that mean to the game state? Um, so we had there was definitely complications uh, along along the way, but as as a whole, the concept rolled out relatively okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, the, or, we didn't end up using Orasma, but Orasma was definitely something that we were playing with. Orasma is something that I use on a, on a daily basis um, just to kind of augment business cards or um, just to do fun little experiences. Um, you, it's, it's got a relatively powerful back end where you can um, put 3D animations over the top of stuff and it's all free and, and open source. Um, and Vuforia and Unity is obviously the, the combination that, that we use to be able to bring the AR component to life, but it's a little bit trickier to build something than get it onto the App Store. Uh, and Blender is what we use to create all of our, all of our animation. Uh, at that time, we, we built the Monster Zoo on um, Android upon advice of, of the developer. In hindsight, I probably just would have gone straight to uh, iOS, the, but the thing in the wall was built specifically for, for iOS. Um, but the most important thing was the camera that was on the back of the device because that's what they, they used to be able to bring that um, AR experience to life. Yes? Why, you just, why would you just go to iOS directly? Why what, sorry? Why would you just go directly to iOS today? Um, because, well, 
because <laughs> I own 10 iPads is probably the main reason why. Um, but the, after building the Monster Zoo on, on Android and then building it on, on iOS, I kind of preferred the process of using iOS as a platform to deliver it on. Um, and I've, I, I've found that they're probably just, but I've got like probably crappy old Aces that I was using for the Monster Zoo and I've got brand new iPads. So now I'd probably prefer to use the most modern device that I've got. Um, but I found, in, and this is just based on building the Monster Zoo versus building the thing in the wall. I found the thing in the wall, which was just specifically for iOS, was an easier process. But that, that, that that's it. That's all the information I've got. Is that because of the screen size? Or because with Android, you would have sort of... It was smaller. Because Android's got lots of different screen sizes and... Well, we were only rolling the Monster Zoo out on two devices. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, so it didn't have anything to do with the screen size. It was more, I just prefer iPads. <laughs> I think it's kind of what it comes down to. I'm assuming that I'm not in a room full of iPad likers. So the actual software you used to put it together, the actual video capture at the end, like the. Oh, do you mean like the like the documentaries yeah, the that they produced? Using that was all produced on on iPads. Using what what software? Uh, they were just filming in the camera app, and then we just cut it together using iMovie. Um, so part of uh, Activate, which is, which is my business, is uh, what we do is we teach people how to make films using, using iPads. Um, and um, so we've created this system where you put the iPad in a case, uh, like a specifically designed case, and you can attach tripods, lights, and microphones. So it kind of boosts up the production quality of what you can do. So that when the kids set off on this little adventure, they're running around with uh, a tablet, uh, so, so an Acer, for, which is called the Monster Tracker what I call an iProduction studio, which is an iPad in the case with lights and tripods and whatnot. Uh, and then they had another, excuse me, another iPad as well, which had like a little Prezi on it, which was a map. So if they got lost, they could navigate their way through it. So they all walked around with, with one piece of technology as, as a group. Um, so this is a, a slimmed down version of the, of, of the process that we went through. Um, so in the pre-production part of the process, um, it was very much about writing the script, assembling the team, figuring out who's going to be doing what, um, engaging voice artists. So for this, um, I was one of them because it was all done basically on no money whatsoever. Um, I was, which one am I? I'm the hairy nose wombat. He's very gang gangster and angry, which was fun. Uh, and then I had two other people that help, helped um, voice the characters. Um, and then we went through designing, designing the monsters, um, pulling them into a, a, blen a blender, and bringing in like the, the voice narration, uh, and then bringing them to life, and then using Unity and Vuforia to, to build it, and then it just exported directly onto the, the Acer devices, which, which we're using to run the experience, uh, and then we launched it at, at, uh, at Awesome Arts. So that's pretty much the summary of the, the Monster Zoo. Um, I think M's up. I oh, don't know, that's me. Uh, but I think I've covered all of that. Yes, cool, awesome. Now it ends up. And is there any other questions before the month before I go on the monster zoo? No? Cool. Uh, yep. So, so how do you fund it yourself? Do you pay uh, the uh, artist and all that sort of stuff? Or? Um, so I after I conceptualized the concept um, and then took it to um, I took it to the, the the festival, who I'd already had a relationship with. Um, uh, they they basically pre-booked a whole heap of workshops. So we run two workshops a day for six days of, of the festival. Um, so it was enough cash for me to be able to pay my animators and I paid my animators and my the AR realizer and the facilitators for the festival. I didn't, I didn't make any money, but they, they all got paid. Um, and since then we've been able to roll, we've rolled the project out uh, at two other festivals, two other children's festivals, as well as it was exhi exhibited at the hybrid um, festival for Brisbane Asia Pacific Film Festival as well. Um, it's, it's certainly not a money maker. It's more about a, a love project getting a cool concept out there. But everyone's getting paid. <laughs> I don't do stuff that people don't get paid for. Hey. So how much is each workshop uh, for the kids? Uh, for the kids to, in, like, to participate in it, like what the festival charged them, I think it was $25. For how long? Uh, it was about an hour and a half to two hours. Um, but it depends on the festival. Like we run it at a, a festival down in Sydney called Way Out West Festival, and all of their programming is free. So kids were, and like that was, 
that was bonkers. There was like kids on waiting lists. It was like they're at a rock concert. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just depends on, on the festival. They change it. Like sometimes we've done something similar at Brisbane Powerhouse and they pay, they charge like $15. So it's really up to the festival what they want to charge. Hmm, no worries. From that kind of first experience that you took through in Perth, did you um, find, you know, have any findings during that? And you thought, oh, I didn't see that and would roll into your next program? Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. There was probably a few aha moments and a lot of them got injected into the thing in the wall with, with, uh, with Emily. So I learned a lot. The biggest, I think the biggest thing that surprised me was how the kids responded to the technology. So going through this process and thinking that, and I still believe that augmented reality is like a, like a new form of magic. And I remember the first time I saw it and how I felt and how overwhelmed I was with happiness. I just assumed that the kids would feel the exact same way when they were introduced to it. Not at all. Like, I remember when I first saw my augmented monsters, I nearly started crying. I was so, I was so happy and proud, but also I'm like, this is, this is magic. This is what magic looks like. And so on the first day of the Monster Zoo, of the very first workshop, I remember this moment very clearly. Um, we're all set off, we've got our equipment, everyone's excited, and they scan the first monster. I'm right, I'm right, like, I'm like this, this is it. This is when everyone's gonna lose their shit. And then I just went, oh yeah, cool, cool. And then, then they just listen to what the monster says. And I'm like, Sam, I'm just going, what? <laughs> Are you serious? This is incredible. And then they're just like, no, shh, I can't hear what the monster's saying. And then, so what, what I learned from that is that they don't, they don't even care about the tech. Like they just live in this world where they, everything is digital to them. So they don't, they don't really care. What it relied on was having a good story. From that moment on, all they cared about was getting that monster back in its enclosure. Um, which again, I kind of took that experience and put it into the thing in the wall. I was like, right, so it's very much about telling a good story the tech just has to work and they just it just has to look cool other than that it, it all come comes back to story um, but yeah I was I was very surprised and slightly saddened at the same time um, cool all right I'll hand you over to to M yep Thanks. Yep. oh is that why you were trying to take it off the yeah, floor yeah. and you were like oh no yeah all right hi everybody uh, my name's Emily Craven. I, uh, like Ty, am not a developer. I am a writer and a producer. Um, I do have a degree in space science and astrophysics, which I've never used ever. And I did maybe like a semester of programming in like MATLAB and C++. And I think that was like the extent of the programming that I did. Um, but I do work with some absolutely lovely developers um, and they were the ones who helped me pull together Story City. So Story City um, is basically an app that allows you to tell story and location. So we do things like real life choose your own adventures through cities. Uh, we do things like uh, art tours, puzzle trails. Um, and so the idea being is that, you know, by standing in the location and having the story happen around you, we're trying to create that augmented reality feel of merging the fiction with the fantasy by actually physically being in the space. So the original way that this idea particularly came about was a combination of a couple of things. So you had obviously the, the choose your own adventures from childhood where no matter what pathway I took, I always ended up dying. And even if I tried to reverse engineer it by finding the point where you won and then went back the other direction, I still couldn't make it back to the start in any reasonable order. So I remember doing like I remember doing that as like a Jedi in a Star Wars choose your own adventure and just like always getting my head chopped off or anyway. So you had to choose your own adventures. Uh, then you had things like geocaching. Uh, there were people who produced something called the Wonderlust app. And then there was the wonderful QR code, which was started this whole concept in the first place. So Wonderlust stories was something that was put together by um, a game company over in the US as a demonstration for South by Southwest. They basically combined the, I think it's the Foursquare database with um, their game engine and so the idea behind it was is that you could create a story that was set in the location where you were standing um, but it didn't have to be in a specific location so for example um, if you had a story where there was supposed to be a train and it someone was arriving on a train uh, what would happen is that the app would um, have the Foursquare database in it and you had to be standing in a train station it didn't have to be like you know Grand Central train station it just had to be any train station. So as long as it detected that you were in a train station, it would open up that section of the story with the idea that if you were in the right atmosphere, that made the story feel more real. So they just did it for a demonstration, thought it was a great laugh, and then 
shut the program down. But they could have done so much more with that. Then we have things like geocaching. So has anyone here done geocaching? Does, do people know what geocaching is? Yep, okay. So, so the idea behind geocaching, people have hidden like little Tupperware containers or items around the world and people uh, have GPS coordinates associated with it and people will actually go on holidays, trips, adventures, specifically looking for these geocaches around the world. Like people will plan their whole holidays to find these geocaches. And so, you know, when they find them, they might have a logbook in there that they can sign and there might be tokens that people take or things that they leave. And so the idea is, is that it was kind of like a worldwide orienteering. Um, and so at the same time that I was kind of learning about geocaching, Wonderlust stories, and I was doing a little bit of um, looking into how I could market things like ebooks at the time. And that was when I came across um, QR codes. So QR codes kind of looked like they were promising and they never really eventuated, um, but they are those wonderful codes that you find on, used to find on the side of Pepsi cans on, you know, storefronts where you'd scan them and it would take you to a website uh, and you could view, you know, like content or get coupons for cheap addresses or whatever. Um, and I always thought that it was a wasted opportunity that when you scanned it and they took you to a website where they just gave you more marketing, you could do so much more than that because you can put a QR code anywhere uh, you can scan it with a free app. Uh, you can know, tell how many people have scanned that code as well. And you could present them with a story in the location that they're standing. There were so many different things that you could do it. You know, you send them to a website and that website could have anything on it. So I combined all of those to create the pilot project, which was Adelaide Choose Your Own Adventure. So what we did was uh, at my work, I printed out a whole heap of these posters, uh, put them <laughs> on bits of cardboard and zip tied them to poles around the city in Adelaide during French Festival. Uh, I did have the permission of the council to do this, uh, but at the same time, because it was during Fringe, there were a lot of drunk people about, you know, there was hooligans down for Clipsal, uh, and we lost about six to eight posters a day over the two week period that we ran it. So I think that maybe a grand total of 10 people finished the experiment, um, but those that did, uh, really enjoyed it and caught the attention of the Brisbane City Council. And so when I moved up to Brisbane, they actually invited me to create um, the experience for them and they gave me a budget to do it so I didn't have to zip tie things to poles. And so what we did with them was that we created a whole heap of uh, ground uh, graphics that you can stick onto the concrete. They're generally pretty hard to remove. Um, and so what happened was we put these codes on QR code on, on posters and scattered them around the city with the idea being that you would start at the main code and then the story would happen around you and you'd be given a choice as to where you would go next. And depending on that choice, you would go to a different location. So you would end up in a different part of the city and you would end up with a different ending to your story. Um, now the problem with that obviously is that you still have to keep an eye on these sorts of things. They still get ripped up and vandalized and council crews change over and don't realize that events are happening and rip up their own posters. Um, so we wanted to have a much more permanent solution to that and something where we didn't have to be on the ground to set it up, something where we could set it up in any city in the world um, and something that we didn't have to monitor. And so that was where the Story City app came into play. So the Story City app is uh, both an Android and an iOS app. I dealt with a developer called um, Eric Worrell, who is based out of Harvey Bay, um, and he codes for, for both of those spaces. And basically what happens is um, these apps plug into a WordPress website. I wanted a way that I would be able to create and update the content without having to go through the de developer to code things. And so what he did was he created a plugin that hooked the app into WordPress. And so anytime I created a new story, updated an old story, it would be able to update within a couple of minutes of me updating it on the website. And so the idea behind it is that when you're in the app, you can either view stories based on the location where they start or on a list of stories that tell you exactly how far away you are from the start point. And then when you go into a story, it tells you all about what the story is about. In this particular story, you are a pirate captain going through Brisbane, searching for pirate supplies and crew to beat the nefarious Captain Neckbeard to a secret treasure based in Brisbane. Uh, and so from there, when you get into the story, we have artwork, audio, and text that is associated with it. And the app can also handle video as well, but we haven't really done a lot of playing around with film and the app yet. 
um, and then you basically get given choices as to where to go next. And you have to physically walk to that location before the app will unlock that. So it all works basically off geofences is the idea. And so you might start off at the upside down elephant next to Goma Museum. Um, you might be the hero's um, apprentice in this particular case. Um, and you decide, yes, you're going to go and help the hero against the villain or no, you've decided that you're having a really lovely day and you don't need to be chased by someone who's very evil and uses ibis birds for evil purposes. And so you may instead decide to go to the MacArthur Chamber or in another case, you may go to the immigration art, which is by the Big Wheel of Brisbane. So the great thing about Story City is that it actually forces people to get up and move around a space. And by setting it in a location where the story is set, it kind of adds that extra level of atmosphere and ambience to the story and gets people to connect with a place that they wouldn't normally connect with if they weren't actually standing in it. So this type of storytelling is something called locative literature. So there are a whole heap of different examples of locative literature and I just wanted to tell you about a couple of them because they're all super interesting. So you obviously have your um, stock standard history walks that you'll see a lot of apps for. Cairns has got one, City of Sydney's got one where they have these wonderful walks and they'll take you along and they'll narrate bits of history to you. They'll show you old photographs of the buildings and the people who were around. Um, and that seems to be becoming much more common where councils will actually hire developers to create them these one-off apps that allow them to do this type of storytelling. Then you have um, apps that are kind of slightly more complicated versions. So this app called Silent History is a combination of locative literature and a story. So the idea behind the story is, is that there is this generation of children that have been born without language. They can't speak, they can't communicate. And so what happens is the story about these children is told through the perspective of the people who look after them, the carers, the parents, the teachers, the people who meet them on the streets. And so there is a main story that has been written by the writers that <clears throat> you can buy the seasons of that details the stories of these children. But then they get the community to engage and interact with the story by submitting their own field reports. And so what happens is that these field reports, so this is New York City, and so what happens is the field reports submitted by users, um, so they are basically field reports from the perspective of those different people that I was telling you about. The um, people from Silent History will go through them, pick the people that they want to collaborate with, and they will actually physically place those field reports on maps around the world. So um, New York's one of the higher density ones, um, San Francisco's another one, London's another one. Um, so the major cities around the world started to get populated by these field reports by people that added to the story, added to the intrigue, um, added to the characters of the children. And so you can only view the field reports if you're actually standing in the location. Um, another type of locative storytelling is an app by the name of Zombies Run. Has anyone here not heard of Zombies Run? Couple of people. Okay. So Zombies Run is technically a fitness app. So it's like a walking slash running app. And so the idea behind it is, is that you're listening to this particular experience, you're running slash walking along, and there is a zombie story being narrated to you. And so what it does is it uses the GPS on your phone. And as you're running along, it'll be narrating the story to you. You are runner five. You are doing things like picking up supplies, warning other cities about zombie invasions, um, you know, um, trying to stop further infection, those sorts of things. And so what happens is as you're running, it might tell you all of a sudden that a zombie horde is coming in from your left. And if you do not run fast enough, you get caught by the zombies and eaten. Uh, and the GPS will follow you to see if you have increased your speed. And if you haven't increased your speed, then it's game over. So the idea behind it is to get people like myself, who are very reluctant runners slash power walkers, and, <laughs> and try to get us uh, interested in being a little bit more enthusiastic about our health. Uh, and so I actually spoke to the woman who wrote for this came to the Brisbane Writers Festival last year, Naomi Alderman. And she said the hardest part about writing this, they're now up to their fifth season. So they have uh, something along the line of like two and a half million downloads. And, and every time they release a season, they have a minimum of like 120,000 people by that season. Um, and so she said the hardest part of writing that was the fact that you always had to be running. 
So coming up with storylines where you always have to be running is actually very difficult. So she said in one, in season five, she had resorted to you being captured by this evil villain person, tied up and then like dragged behind a jeep while the villain revealed his evil plan to you. So there are problems and, um, and, and um, I suppose interesting complications that you have to figure out when you're working with real locations as opposed to physically making up all of these uh, scenarios and landscapes up. So <clears throat> for that, locations can be really great because not only um, when, when you pick your locations, you have to be quite careful because you can't just send people to a random street corner because people will only follow novelty for so long. What they want you to do is send them to interesting places. So a couple of the things on here, for example, um, these are a couple of pictures from Adelaide. So if you go down one of the main streets in Adelaide, Rundle Street, and you're walking along a whole heap of shops, there's actually a tiny little door at the bottom of one of the shops. And it says, oh, look, a tiny little door, a tiny little shop, let's go in and buy something. Like that's what it says on the little sticker on the top of the, the door. Um, and I wouldn't have known that was there until we started writing stories for this location. Uh, in another sort of side street in Adelaide, there's like a little car park. It kind of looks ordinary. There's just a whole heap of a yellow wall. But then if you look up two stories, you realize that that wall is covered by tiny matchbox cars. Just like three three levels of it, just matchbox cars stuck all over it. And so those sorts of things help to, um, I suppose, you've taken people to an interesting location that they wouldn't have seen before. And then what you can do is that you can then set scenarios in that place. So for example, with that tiny door, you could be in a Thumbelina type situation or like, you know, an Alice in Wonderland situation where you get shrunk and you have to walk into the door. Or it could be someone who you are following who you thought was a sane person and they're like, quick, we're gonna help you catch the bad guy and they come to the door and they go, quick, get inside that door so we can hide and you realize that they're insane. And so you can use the location in interesting ways to tell things about the story, about the characters. But the thing about having locative literature is, is that you can't make too much shit up. So you can't set stories at a specific time of day because you don't know whether someone's going to be doing it at day or night. You can't use specific gender pronouns because you don't know whether the person who is using this is going to be male or female. And even you have to be quite careful about your language. I remember in one of the stories where you were Death's Apprentice going through the streets of Brisbane and we had a complaint from someone who said that they were a girl and they would never rugby tackle someone. And so she felt like she was meant to be a boy in that scenario. And so you have to be quite careful of the language that you use and the stories that you tell and who you are um, setting your audience up to be and letting them know that if they are going to be playing a character that you kind of have to let them know up front. So there are a couple of kind of things that um, you can do with location that you um, can't do um, as, I suppose, immersively in um, digital screen space. So there are different things that we use um, or different types of, uh, what's the word? Um, techniques, maybe. That's not the right word, but it's, it'll do. There are different techniques that we use to kind of help create that immersion. So for example, you might leave a, a set of clues in, in terms of like a scavenger hunt. So you might um, have people count the number of palings on a fence and that's how many steps you have to take to the left to get to the next spot. Um, you might do puzzles which need to be solved to get to the next location. So they might have to solve a particular puzzle to be able to unlock something or to be able to figure out where they're going next. Um, then you might have games like physical activities that you can actually get the participants to do. So if they're at a playground, uh, and in one of the stories we had, uh, you were training for a spy academy and so in the playground had a whole heap of different colours on the ground and you were only allowed to step on the blue colours um, to be able to climb up a slide or something so you had to prove your physical fitness as part of the story. Um, then there are things like um, challenges, so getting people to, you know, hug a tree, say a rhyme to like lure out fairy tale creatures. Yeah. Sorry, just mm. um, if all it sounds like the main technology behind this mm. only really relies on geofencing and QR codes or something similar. Geofencing, yep. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you ensure that somebody has only stepped on the blue squares going up the slide? So it's, 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 you can't really ensure that. Um, I suppose it's more about how... Um, 
how enthusiastic a participant is in doing those sorts of things. Um, you find that a lot if you've got kids in families, they will tend to do the activities because the parent is looking for a way to keep their child amused and so they will make them do it. You might find that though people who are, who are older may not do it. Um, things like solving clues or puzzles have to be done to move to the next location, but doing those physical challenges are more a way of inviting people to interact with the environment, um, but they don't have to do it necessarily. Um, the other thing that's really fun is to get kids to create things. So in one particular story, um, a council wanted us to get across ideas like, you know, information about flora and fauna so that kids could learn a little bit more about the parks they were moving through. And so we actually got them to make things like a leaf boat or make like a little character out of gum nuts and leaves and things like that and leave it under a playground for somebody else who came along doing the next adventure to find. So almost a cumulative effect in that case. When we looked at telling stories in location, these were the things that we kind of asked ourselves when we were setting the story up. So basically, what is it about the location that sets the scene up so that you can play on? What might happen to bring attention to that feature? Because sometimes the features might be very small, uh, particularly if you're only doing this as an audio thing rather than a visual thing. You basically have to draw people's to be able to move left or right. What are they supposed to be looking at? Um, and then does the location basically have an atmosphere that can be played on? And uh, again, going on the thing of people will only follow novelty so far, you can't make the locations too far apart, otherwise people are going to get sore feet and give up halfway through. Um, so these are kind of the thoughts and the things that I did. And so when we went to work together with Ty... Sorry, yeah. story between them? Points or no, at the points. Only at the points. Only at the points, yeah. And then you walk between the locations. You could potentially turn it on and walk if you wanted to, but that's something that's kind of hard to set up with geofences um, in cities. Um, geofences can be incredibly accurate, but at the same time, if you are near giant skyscrapers and you can't get a good GPS signal, um, then getting things to trigger as people are walking um, becomes a very inaccurate thing so it's better to let them stand in the location and narrate the story and then get them to move than it is to try and narrate things on the way because you can't be sure whether or not a person's how accurate a person's gps is funnily enough i found out that iphone gps is a much worse than android ones you would think that it would be the other way around but no mm. um so from that, so we had Ty who was doing the augmented reality and then myself who was doing the locative literature. And so what we wanted to do is we kind of wanted to merge those two things together to create the uh, immersive experience of the thing in the wall. Did you want to have sure. a little bit of a chat about that, Ty? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. Um, uh, so the um, moving f so from the monsters, the idea was, to, I guess, to kind of um, uh, I guess step it up a little bit with what we could do with augmented reality storytelling. Um, and so when I found out what Emily was doing, I was like, right, well, I kind of wrote the monsters, and I didn't really know what I was doing as far as a writer is concerned. So I thought it might be good to actually get somebody who knows about locative literature to help me develop the next concept. Um, and we were approached by um, Ashgrove State School to build something for their literature festival um, but they basically had hardly any money at all so what I said to Emily was like let's come up with a concept that um, we basically don't get paid for we'll just pay the key people but then we have a product that we can we can sell to other schools okay, um, we don't get paid no <laughs> No, no, we never get paid. Um, so we, what, what, we, what we did strategically was to build a concept that could be rolled out at any school, no matter where you were. So the clues are all based on uh, uh, facilities that every single school uh, has. Um, and 
I guess Emily's stuff is relatively complex in comparison to the Monster Zoo. So what we did was kind of merge those, those two, two, two worlds together. So the, um, the problem with this experience is that um, the, the poster that's on the wall, that's the, um, the character who's stuck in the wall, hence the name Thing in the Wall. It's how original we are with our concepts. Um, and the idea of it is that he's stuck in the wall and the kids have to figure out a way to be able to get him out. The way they do that is be, by following a series of clues that are delivered to them by by other creatures that are scattered around the school. Um, and uh, like I said before, the projects that I work on, I always like to have like a some sort of social element, like some sort of, I guess, message, particularly because I work with young kids a lot as well. I want to have some sort of message that we send to them. And so what we did with that is each of the characters that they meet, they're all responsible for things that go missing in a kid's life. So there's like the sock thing, for example, he steals kids' socks and the lunchbox thing, he steals kids' lunchboxes. And the way that we designed it is that when they, when they meet the monsters, they're like, we'll help you, uh, we'll help you um, solve this problem, but you have to bring us something. You need, you need to reward us for us to be able to give you the information. Um, Bribes the world. Yeah, essentially, bro. Which they're used to because they're children. Um, and underneath the underneath that poster set set um, set a large box of what well, was basically like a box of lost property, and it was filled with a whole heap of crazy stuff. Um, but also, it had the objects that that they needed to bring to the creature. Um, and and within that, they had uh, the correct thing to bring and the incorrect thing to bring. Um, so my lovely assistant here is showing you the lunchbox example. So the unhealthy lunchbox has things that are bad for you like ice cream and croissants and whatnot. And then the healthy lunchbox has um, fruit and vegetables and that kind of stuff. So when they meet the lunchbox thing, which is a weird piranha looking fish thing, um, uh, he would say, bring, bring, me, bring me a tasty lunchbox for the treats that I, wanna, I want to eat. Um, so the kids would have to run back to the library, which is where it's all set up and ready to run from. Um, and then they would take the lunchbox back to him. So like kids like running all around school, which is pretty cool. Um, and then they scan, yeah. Literally <laughs> for their life. <laughs> um, and then they scan the lunchbox into the system and then it'll tell them whether it's the right one or the wrong one. If it's the correct one, then they go back and speak to the creature and then um, they'll be able to unlock the next level to be able to move them up through the game state. Um, but what we've found, and I've rolled this out um, from everything to preppies, right up to year nines, the exact same experience, they all, they all get into it. Like they just get so lost in the story. And M's right, like they just, they seriously like pelt from one end to the other, which is hilarious when you know that they're running with the wrong object as well. And you're like, ah, I'm just gonna let it slide. <laughs> and then you see them like running back five minutes later. Um, but it was, it's been an interesting thing to, to kind of roll out. Um, so each of them are responsible for different things, um, but the social, I guess the social element that runs through it. Well, so, you know, one's like responsible for, for hats, so like sun safety, the one's eating healthy, one's socks, which is presenting yourself well. Um, one is uh, the pencil thing, and they're all about being like a good student. Um, but the thing in the wall, the way that you get him out of the wall is by um, basically the whole time he's got his, uh, his fist clenched. Um, and what the last thing says before you go back to him is that he just needs to let go. And, and the story that he tells is that he's actually stolen somebody's bad thoughts. If he just lets go of those bad thoughts, then he'll be able to pop out of the wall and, and go home, um, which is really beautiful. Because then by the end of it, you've got this group of kids like screaming, just let go at an, at an iPad. And then the conversation that we get to have afterwards is all about, you know, like letting go of bad thoughts and only holding on to good thoughts and that kind of stuff. Um, but we, we built this with, I guess, the experience that both her, uh, both Emily and I have with, with building experiences like this. But I also consulted with the Department of Education as well and said, look, this is the kind of thing that we're building. What are the things that you want to have, have in it? Um, because the original incarnation didn't have any sort of being healthy or anything like that. So we, we built all that in based on what the department was, was asking for. Um, but yeah, do you want to talk about writing for it? Uh, well, oh. you basically covered my Oh, yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, so, but, but the idea is, is that when you choose your too. location for your schools, um, it's, it's, as you guys know, that sometimes it's quite quite difficult to um, to commercialise games. And so what we wanted to make sure that we could do is that we would have a product where, yes, we didn't get paid very much money to create the product itself, but we wanted something that, that could be transportable between schools and something that wouldn't cost the earth for schools to be, then be able to use because developing these sorts of things can cost a lot of money. And so what we wanted to do is we ended up picking locations that we knew would, that would be at every school regardless of whether or not they were a state school, a private school, Catholic school, whatever. So we had, um, you would have uh, things at the Oval, uh, that at an undercover 
play area at a, um, a tuck shop or, a, or your cafeteria um, and then at a, like a music room and then the library. So you could be guaranteed that most schools would have those five locations and then you can play in those locations as well. You can smell food at the cafeteria, you can hear kids screaming on the oval, there are birds you know diving on people uh, across the, the oval. We used to have plovers at our school, crows and all sorts of things. Um, and so those were the things that you could you could translate across experiences and across um, I suppose um, um, <coughs> money brackets, uh, income. It, you know whether it, whether a school was poor or social. Yes, is this the my word bag is not working tonight. I'm a war, I'm a writer and I just don't have a good word bag tonight. Um, and so 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 we we wanted to have uh, something that was specific to location, but at the same time could be generic enough that you could transpose it between anywhere. And so we also wanted to make things um, as interactive as possible as well. So rather than just following things on an easy I suppose, um, easy pathway. We wanted people to be able to have um, a chance of failing part way through, which was the whole idea again of this box of lost things and being able to find the correct thing to bring back to the monster. Um, I think that's that's the only stuff that you didn't cover already. Yeah, yeah. But so it's basically yeah go, exactly. Go to the next slide. Yes. Sorry. Um, in terms of design, because you said mm -hmm. that you actually want them to have a chance of failing. Um, yep. Just about every project I've worked on for kids tends to want the opposite. Well, it's a learning it's a learning experience, right? So, so the idea is that um, uh, with a lot of with a lot of kids, the idea is that um, they're quite impulsive, and some of the time you will find that they don't listen completely to um, you know like a set of instructions or, or a set of um, you know. Um, a bit of a story or whatever and so I suppose the idea of building in that that um, that that choice. choice into it was to get them to be like to, to learn as they go along that okay if I just listen for a little bit longer I can get the right thing if I listen to the clue a little bit longer I can make sure that I get to the right place and so the idea being that we want people to think about it rather than being impulsive about it uh, it did yeah, actually. Some things did, some things didn't. Mm. Yeah, hey. worked out ways how to hijack it. Are there any lessons mm. that you could give about that particular point? Because I find that really interesting in terms of not what the big thing allowing them to fail. The the, the, the reason why it got built in was again from the Department of Transport. Uh, sorry, the <laughs> Department of Education that they wanted they want kids to make decisions. It's more. It's not so much about failing or succeeding, it's more about making the right decision. So if I have two lunch boxes in front of me, which is the more appropriate one for, for school? So it was, it, was more, it was more about that, like getting them to make a choice. Uh, so if you bring them the wrong thing, they basically, it's, it's not very horrible. They basically, they basically say, you brought me the wrong thing. How dare you bring me back the right thing? But it's it's the 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 it's soft failure. But because um, the s schools are so large, it can seem like a large failure because it may take them two minutes to run back and then another two minutes to come back. So it's almost like they're feeling the failure in a physical way as well as a mental way. And they do. <laughs> they, they, so, so sometimes we would sometimes we would run along. We would go, wait 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 wait. Are you sure you've got the right sock? And they're like, <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, fine. Oh, yeah, off you go. Yes. As far as resource is concerned, you have like an iPad per monster? Uh, per group. So, so you would have them in groups of five. Um, and so they would all huddle around the iPad and then you would move, then they would move as a group to the next monster, so decode the puzzle. As, would they be moving with the iPad, aren't they? Yeah. Yes. So mm -hmm. Running with the iPad. Well one, well, one of the storytelling components that we add into it is that, what's one of the, it's more of a, just a rule that we give them, is that the, the iPad stays with the creature. Yeah. So because they're in a group of five, you know, what kids are like, they, they want... So they run with the cat. Uh, well, but they, more that they, they, everybody wants to feel like they're playing a part or they're contributing. So one of the things that were the parameters that we set up at the start is that the iPad always stays with, with the monster and then everybody gets a chance of running back and, and grabbing something, which means the tech stays relatively safe uh, and everyone has a go to be able to run back and go, go out and come back. The, the biggest problem that we found was um, 
was the was the audio level and it was the same with the monster zoo as well so this is a bad example the other one that i've got we ended up like velcroing little mini speakers on the front of that um, because the kids get so excited and and so into it that you, it's very difficult to hear what the monsters are saying um, and as soon as you can't hear what the clues are everything everything falls apart so yeah, well, I mean, like the little speakers that we have, I didn't bring them with me. They're like little Moki speakers. They're like little hamburger things that yeah. pimp out. They're like hardcore. They're, they're, they're really loud, exactly what the projects need. Um, so with, with this, because we had no money, we didn't design the creatures. I literally just bought them from the so, assets. So, I mean, from, a, from, a, from a school point of view, you're looking at five or six iPads plus a bit of material. Mm. Yeah. Uh, generally, um, so the idea is, is that we would go to schools that already had iPads. So the idea that um, at, the, at the moment you would go to schools who already have iPads as part of their libraries and then you would load it onto those iPads and then they could cycle them through as many classes as they wanted to. Yeah, yeah or we, because I've, I've got a whole heap of iPads or I just take everything to the school. I'm just thinking from a, from a, from a teacher's point of view, if they wanted to do it or do it there. Yes, would... yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so we just we we just bought the assets from the um, Unity Asset Store. Um, I just collected a whole heap of creatures that kind of all looked and felt the same. Um, the I guess the biggest problem that we had is I bought, um, and this was like we we're already far down the rabbit hole before we could go back. Um, but the thing in the wall, we couldn't. Um, his jaw wasn't broken, so when I bought him, I just assumed that we could open and close his mouth. But we couldn't, um, and so when he when he talks, his head just kind of goes up and down. The kids don't seem to care, um, and the rest of them are, are relatively okay. But that's probably my biggest regret with this project, and it does my head in every time I see him talk. Um, it was just going to cost too much money and take too much time to actually break his draw. And by that point in time, I'd already designed, or I had a designer that was doing all like the marketing collateral and that kind of stuff. Um, and other than that, it just needs a bit of a edit from a writing perspective. Um, the creatures, it needs to be shorter. yeah, the creatures just talk for a little bit too long, and the kids, they're, they're there, they're they're engaged, but they're kind of like, okay, right, yeah, I've got the information, I just kind of want, I want to run, I want to run away now. Not, not well. There's, there's a well, yeah, but we, I did it with like year nines, and they did it in like twenty minutes. As far as the as as far as the lunchbox are concerned, the, the good, bad, good and bad lunchbox, did you have like, is it put it on the actual monster or how does it identify those assets? Oh, they've got, they got barcodes on them. So, oh, e e yeah, each of the objects have got little barcodes on it. Yeah. Uh, and again, that was so that the schools, if they wanted to, could either just print out pictures with the code on the back, or they could go out to an op shop and buy a whole heap of old socks and hats and stuff and actually pimp out a box. Yes. Uh, so how long do they end up being, like three to four minutes? What? The, the, the sections. They ended up being like three to four minutes, so I would say that two minutes is probably... What do you mean, like how long they talk for? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I reckon like 30 seconds to a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Particularly for the little ones, else they just they just disengage. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything over that, and it's just redundant. It's just yeah, talking for the purpose of talking. Um, I think that's it. If you guys wanted to come and have a look and test it out and try out all the part of the codes and stuff like that, we've got two iPads. Mhm. Mm yeah, yeah. Have a look at it all. Otherwise, feel free to ask us any and all questions that may or may not be tough. Thank you for indulging us. Yeah. <laughs>